Namaste. 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 Every night is a sacred night. But we have to be aware of that sacredness. And Mother speaks to us about fear of the inexplicable. She says, fear of the inexplicable has not alone impoverished the existence of the individual. The relationship between one human being and another has also been cramped by it, as though it had been lifted out of the riverbed of endless possibilities and set down in a fallow spot on the bank, to which nothing happens. For it is not inertia alone that is responsible for human relationships repeating themselves from case to case, indescribably monotonous and unrenewed. It is shyness before any sort of new, unforeseeable experience with which one does not think oneself able to cope. Very, very interesting. A little bit more. But only someone who is ready for everything, which excludes nothing, not even the most enigmatic, will live the relation to another as something alive and will himself draw exhaustively from his own existence. For if we think of this existence of the individual as a larger or smaller room, it appears evident that most people learn to know only a corner of their room, a place by the window, a strip of floor on which they walk up and down. Thus they have a certain security, and yet that dangerous insecurity is so much more human, which drives the prisoners in Poe's stories to feel out the shapes of their horrible dungeons and not be strangers to the unspeakable terror of their abode. What do we have to fear who have come to the mother and Sri Aurobindo? There is nothing to fear. Nothing at all can touch you. So, I wanted to read one poem to you by um, a gentleman. His name is Leonard Clark. And most of you will not know of him. But once in a while a poet catches something and it comes down without his even asking for it. And if you are quiet, if you are concentrated, you can ask the muse for help. If you are inclined towards poetry, inclined towards writing, towards art, towards music, the muse is always there to help you. Well, we say muse, but of course it's the divine. So some poets, and Sri Aurobindo has liberally praised them for bringing touches of the overmind down onto the earth. One of them is A.E., George Russell. Another one is William Butler Yeats. And Sri Aurobindo also mentioned some of the earlier ones when he was in school in England, Wordsworth and Milton, and he mentions Dante and so many others. The, the future poetry is not an easy book to read. I'll grant you that. But you can look in different sections of it and find wonderful things that all of us can appreciate. So here is a poem from Ultima Thule by Leonard Clark. He speaks of being marooned 
on an island, marooned by choice, by choice, upon an island where the sea serves as citadel and only guarantee of freedom from the tyranny of maps and guides. We thank the saints who with their blood had blessed these tides, then searched with ardent eyes the rocks and roads to find a further isolation for the heart and mind. Some place so full of peace that we could cast away the last remaining doubts and fear allay. And when the unfettered sun had banished rain and cloud, we saw between the hills a single field, new plowed, and there a continent of calm at our command. Discarded self, the sea, and all that heaving land, we locked ourselves in solitude and had no eyes for anything that flowered on earth or in the skies, nor ears that would at other times have gladly heard the wind in corn, the waves, the song of mounting bird. But in the neutral presence of the simple light, we heard with inner ears and saw with second sight. Magnificent poem. It is Nirvana. He went into Nirvana. Uh, each week, I like to ask Anwo if he would chant a little. Whatever you like, Anwo. Chant the last five verses of the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Purushottama Yoga. Purushottama is the main concept which the Gita has added to the spiritual vocabulary, brought it out into prominence. It speaks of the two Purushas, Akshara being the unity, Shara being the multiplicity, and the Uttama, which harmonizes them perfectly. Vavimam Purushau Loke Sharashchak Shara Kevacha Shara Sarvani Bhutani Utastho Shara Uchyate Uttama Purushas Vanyaha Paramatme Yudahritaha Yolokataya Mavishya Vibharti Avyaya Ishwaraha Yasma Charamati Toham Aksharadapi Chotamaha Atosmi Loke Vedecha Pratitaha Purushottamaha Yomameva Masamudho Janati Purushottamam Sasarvavit Bhajati Maam Sarvabhavena Bharata Ipi-bhūti-yatamam-shāvāsthi Since many of you have been to the Om Choir, I would like to share the story 
of one man who was a spiritual and a physical support for the Om Choir in the ashram. He was in charge of the dining room in the ashram and preparing food for sometimes thousands of people. His name, Ved Prakash. He was such an inspiration to me, and I will tell you a little bit of the story. You know, he designed cooking vats in the ashram kitchen that had double layers of steel. And when he put steam through that, he could cook that much rice in 10 or 15 minutes and serve everyone. He was, he was a magician in this work. But one thing he loved so dearly was the Om Choir. Now he had a very serious fall and for a while he could walk with a limp, but then it gave way and he had to use a, a walker and then that gave way and my friend from Canada, Jacques, would wheel him in a wheelchair to the ashram school. Now, to go up the steps to the video room that I built many years ago, there's a, a rail that you can hold on to, and he would take 20 minutes to climb up those steps, and then someone would help him and bring a chair and seat him in the chair. As his health became worse, I, I tell you this almost in tears, because they would bring him in the wheelchair and he would sit on the first step and with his powerful hands he would push himself up the next step and then up the next step and then they would have to carry him in to the own choir when he got to the top. This was his dedication and such an inspiration for me. And uh, one day we were in the dining room and he's talking to us. And he looks at me and he says, Our Juman Bai loved you very much. And the tears came down my eyes. For minutes I was weeping because Juman Bai was the one who took me in at the age of 23 into Park Ashabo, which is now called Park Guest House. And he looked after me every day. And this man is telling me how much Juman Bai loved me. There's so much to share with you uh, about Oroville and about the ashram. I can tell you a story of the earliest years in the Matrimandia nursery. You know when you go down the road you see a sign that says nursery. Well, it was the Matrimandia Gardens nursery. It was only there for the gardens. And I planted dozens and dozens of trees in what they call the outer gardens. I think they call it the park now. Because we couldn't do any of the inner gardens. There were no designs that were truly acceptable. I was told by mother, as I told you tonight, to prepare to come and build the gardens of the Matrimonia. And now I'm back 
at a slightly advanced age to help in manifesting them. But I suffered for 37 years the guilt of not being able to bring down the gardens at Mother One. I went to my Upa Guru, Arabinda Basu. Does anyone know of Arabinda Basu? One, two, only three people. Hmm. He was a, he was a great yogi. He said to me, get rid of that guilt. The gardens are not yet ready to descend. And it's the descent of the gardens that we have to pray for. It has to be done in perfect harmony. Collective harmony and unity is the only way the gardens will manifest. What did Mother tell me about these gardens? Some of you know, I think only you know already, how many of you heard about this? Oh, all right, so I'm telling a new group. When I came before her in 1969, she wanted to talk to me about the gardens. And she said to me, It must be a thing of great beauty, of such a beauty that when men enter, they will say, Ah, this is it. And they will experience physically and concretely the significance of each garden. In the garden of youth, they will know youth. In the garden of bliss, they will know bliss. Imagine you're walking into the garden of bliss and you will know bliss. Would you ever want to leave? <laughs> and so then mother raised her hand and she went like this to me. One must know how to move from consciousness to consciousness. She was so far ahead of us, and still is. We have a long way to go. But what we can be most grateful for is that we are here. At this time of Earth's history, when the manifestation of the supermind is not only possible, but it's happening. We can't see it so easily, that is true. But some of us have felt it in perhaps small ways. But I can tell you, in the world of the flowers, I have seen this action of this great force. There are flowers I have never seen before, fragrances I have never smelled before, there is beauty that you cannot imagine waiting to come to all of us, waiting until we are ready. And much of this beauty is the result of amateur gardeners who for 20 or 30 years will work with one flower and learn its DNA and learn how to extract it. I know of a man in California who has who has taken Sri Aurobindo's compassion. You all know Sri Aurobindo's compassion flower, I think, or Chilaka. And he has broken the DNA chain so that you can get 
every single color. We never could do that before. When you did Sri Aurobindo's Compassion, they were all colors. And you put them in a barrel or wherever, and now you, if you want white, you can get white, red, pink, lavender. This man, an amateur, did it in his home, studying the plant and learning the secrets of the plant. There was a gentleman in Alabama. During the time when black people were suffering, but he was a magician with plants. His name was George Washington Carver, and he knew every plant and every flower, thousands and thousands of them. And one day, his ingenious students fashioned an insect from three different insects. You could not tell that they had fashioned it. And they brought it to him. And they said, sir, what is this insect? He said, oh, that's a humbug. <laughs> <laughs> he has one quote that I would like all of you to memorize tonight. Anything will give up its secrets if you love it enough. Do we have any questions before we go on? Anyone? Okay. Langston Hughes was another black man in America. You know of him. Wonderful. I'm going to read a very short poem by him called Dream Variations. Because it is something that catches you. And that is the overhead influence. It touches you in a different way. Sri Aurobindo spoke of Malcolm Arnold saying that poetry has to hit you in the solar plexus. And if it doesn't, it's not good poetry. Interesting statement. Sri Aurobindo agreed with him. Dream variations. To fling my arms wide in some place of the sun to whirl and to dance till the white day is done. Then rest at cool evening beneath a tall tree while night comes on gently, dark like me. That is my dream. To fling my arms wide in the face of the sun Dance, whirl, whirl, till the quick day is done. Rest at pale evening, a tall, slim tree. Night coming tenderly, black like me. It catches you. It catches you. So I didn't know I would do... Uh, some poetry, but that's what has come tonight. So this is by a pilot officer, John Gillespie McGee, and it's called High Flight. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wing, wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long delirious burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew, 
and while with silent lifting mind I've trod the high unsurpassed sanctity of space put out my hand and touched the face of God. Matrimonial Gardens Oh, it was a day It was a night And I'm working with my maestri His name was Sundaramurti He was from the Kodakarai village And he was with me from a small youth To a man one night we were walk, walking in the dark and you know in those days Tamil people did not touch white people it was sort of a thing from the village there was a, of course they found out later about white people but, <laughs> but, but in those days they, they didn't touch them suddenly he throws me to the ground and falls on top of me and he says Nara you were about to step on the head of a crate would have killed me in five minutes much more poisonous than the cobra far more poison and he saved my life we had a pump house that was maybe 300 meters from the back of the nursery and we put a pipeline in so we could fill the pools every morning and then pump out the water during the day each one of us had to take a different day of the week and walk through vipers and cobras and mother protected us from everything None of us were ever bit, but one thing mother said, do not kill them. And no one in the nursery ever killed a snake of any kind. If we caught some, and sometimes they were big vipers, and oh, the, the, uh, the rumor around Oroville was, oh, Tamil people, they are, uh, they are afraid of, afraid of snakes. They don't know anything about snakes. Totally false. They would bring a big, big viper, that thick around, in a bucket, and empty him out in front of my house to show me how he moved, how he struck. And when they, when they were finished showing me, they would put him back in the bucket and take him to the canyon and let him go free. We never killed a snake. And none of us were ever bitten, except for a little calf we had, the great bitter one night, and she was gone by the morning. So you can see how that protection is with us in every moment. We don't have to worry about COVID and little things like that. We have to be concerned with the growth of the soul, the progress of the soul of the consciousness, of our unity with each other, our oneness, our love for each other. Those are the things we should be concentrating on. Now, something about the flowers. We have a flower man with us today. Why didn't they touch the white man? Yes. yes. I think it was out of respect. New people coming from different lands, living in this very harsh climate, huh? very little food, almost no electricity in the 1969, 70, 71, 72. We might get an hour or two a day. In May, when the temperature was 40, 41, 42, all that we could do was to soak a sheet in water, wring it out, 
and put it over our bodies and get maybe two hours sleep a night. People do not realize how difficult it was then. Food, rice was filled with stones. This wonderful guy came from Germany, perfect teeth, first day, <laughs> teeth were out, finished. <laughs> and uh, so many, so many stories I could tell you. How are you managing with two hours of sleep? The grace. And only the grace. Nothing and we would work 12 hours a day. That was my sort of request, I'll put it gently. <laughs> and they would say, but you work like 12 men. How are we going to work like one 12 hours? But we built a nursery that was second to none in all of India. People would come from miles and miles away. The chief conservatives of forests would write me letters on the beauty of the gardens, how many new plants they had seen. Not only that, they would invite me to go into the ghats with them and collect seeds. Uh, there was this gentleman at the French Institute, his name was Tani Kaimani, and he and I would go into the scrub jungle forests. You know, they say nothing grows under a tamarind tree. Pure falsehood. One day we were walking there in the heat of the summer. Very tiring to go through those scrub jungles because you've had so many thorns. And I look up and there's a grove of tamarind trees and hanging from the branches are orchids. Native orchids, vandas, beautiful ones that mother named. And so he said, you can collect a few for the gardens. He was a wonderful man, but I'll tell you a sad story because this is the nature of life and we have to be aware of these things. There was a world conference of horticulture and he was the only man from India invited to this conference. Imagine that. But there was no room on the plane. So he was prepared not to go. That very day, one man got sick and he was given his place. They land in Germany and the terrorists get the plane. And only the stewardess and Tanikai money were shot. So, flowers. Sri Aurobindo has written very little about flowers. He has written about the rose very beautifully. But for me, the most important statement he ever made was flowers are the moment's representation of things that are in themselves eternal. If we can remember that and we can make that contact, that inner contact with the flowers, you will not believe what this will do for your life. It will change your life completely. It will bring a new understanding to nature, to the yoga. Because one can do one's entire sadhana through the flowers. Mother has given us all the degrees from the material, the dark red, to the physical, the bright red, to the vital, the purple and lavender, to the psychic, the pink, to the mental, the mind, and higher ranges of mind would be the blue colors of Krishna and Sri Aurobindo, and lastly, the supermental, gold and orange. And each of these flowers, when we were creating the first book, Flowers 
and their messages. We asked mother, would you give us a comment on each of the flowers? 900 flowers. And mother said, yes. This would be the work of a man for his entire life, to name 900 flowers, to get the exact vibration of that flower. The vibration that enters us when we look at it, when we smell it, when we touch it, when we love it. So, Mother gave us her comments on all of those flowers, but she said to us, I want to see all the flowers first. And we had to go all over for months and months and collect the flowers. Of course, the ones that were in France, she already knew. She knew tulips, she knew daffodils, she knew all the temperate climate flowers. But the tropicals, which consist of the greater part of the book that we did, she had to see one more time to make the comment. There were, at that time, about 60 to 80 flowers that I sent to mother. And I would stand by the samadhi and I would listen to mother exclaim about each flower in French. Superb, magnifique. <laughs> or just to hear her speak so loud she would speak when she saw them. So what happened was when, when I first came there, uh, I had a group of people in Southern California, in Los Angeles, actually. Um, Dr. Judith Tiber, uh, whom Sri Arbindo named Jyoti Priya, had a center there, and we worked with her. Uh, in Los Angeles? In Los Angeles. It was called the East-West Cultural, Cultural Center. And so the group of people and I, every weekend, would go out throughout that area and collect the seeds of trees and shrubs and beautiful plants. Now I knew it was subtropical and many would maybe not make it in Oregon, but there's a story behind this. The ashram's greatest gardener was Parichan, and I've just written a book on him, Homage to Parichan. It's just been printed. And this was a man whose love for mother was so great that when you entered his little room, just one street behind the ashram, if you were tired, if you were sad, if you were depressed, if you were beaten down, you couldn't stay that way for one minute. The joy that he expressed in his being, in his words. He would begin to tell you about mother because he had long correspondences with her on flowers and on gardens. You would go out of there so serene and uplifted and with plenty of energy. Now, where was I in this story? Um, go back before Parichan. The mother used to say it in French. And the other Samadhi. Yes, okay. The seeds that we collected in South, in, uh, in Los Angeles, basically. Sometimes we went a little south to uh, San Diego, where it was even milder. I brought, and we started growing many of them in the Matrimonia nursery. And so one day I said, let me go to the Lalbag in Bangalore and I'll take a van full of these plants and I'll give them to the Lalbag because the climate there is about 3,000 feet elevation and much more conducive to subtropical plants. 
Well, I met the director. His name was Dr. Marigalda. And we became good friends. He sends me back to Oroville with 12 magnificent Hawaiian hibiscus. Mother loved these so much that she named them for Oroville. So we had charm of Oroville, realization of Oroville, beauty of Oroville, and so many others. Of those 12, I sent 11 to mother, and I would listen to her explain. And it was, it filled my heart, you know, just to hear the Divine Mother explaining about the beauty of flowers. This is the kind of appreciation that we have to get. We have to open to the flowers, to their significance. Mother called them messages, and she gave us the first title of the book, Flowers and Their Messages. So if we can open to those messages, we can even contact the supermind through them. Here's a flower, a hibiscus, called faith. How many of you knew this before I showed it to you? One, two, three people. Yes, four, four people, very good. Four people out of how many? One. <laughs> Twenty something people here. So we have a ways to go. This is a nice calendar because it gives us different different pictures. And I believe there are quotes also, but they're not mother's quote, but they are quotes from the mother. So, do start looking at flowers in a different way. Looking at them as the highest expression of nature. Because their entire life is a seeking for light. And the culmination of that seeking is their blossoming. What could be more relevant to the human consciousness than we seek for light and the blossoming of our consciousness is in the highest realms, reaching beyond the mind to the supernatural. Can we, can I ask if you have any questions? Now, Izzy, could you share more about human rights? Hmm? More about human rights? He was energy itself, <laughs> wasn't he? Yes. A man of such great energy. And never a negative word came from his mouth to me. Never spoke negatively about anyone. And, of course, he planted the service tree, I believe with Udar, in front of Mother. And that service tree Mother gave me to care for for the rest of my life. She sent Parichan with a blessing packet, and he said, This is from Mother, for you to care for the service tree for the rest of your life. They took it away from me and there were two people who didn't know a lot about trees, but I don't criticize anyone. I have a quote. Only one quote ever came to me, <laughs> so I'll share it with you. Never judge anyone until you can see their soul. And when you see their soul, there will be no need to judge. Finished. That's my contribution. Any other questions? <laughs>
His correspondence with the mother is published now in the new volume. The first correspondence is his, Dumans. Dumans? Yes. Oh, wonderful. It's a wonderful correspondence. Yes. He was a workaholic, I would say. He did everything for mother. He, uh, well, it was the dairy, there were farms. Uh, he did so much. It was just energy itself. I'm going to read that as soon as possible. Yeah. I think for, um, for all of it, he has bought a big piece of land to grow rice. Anna Yes, he did. That's his contribution to all of it. So many acres which we have not even used a quarter of it. And he loved Oroville also because it was mother's creation. Uh, Next, shall we read a small poem on it, sir? Surely. Okay. A, a small poem. Yes. Another poem. Okay. This is a poem by E. E. Cummings. And he wrote in a very, very strange poetical way. But he had touches of an overhead experience. So the English is a little bit convoluted, but I'll take it slowly for you. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day, for the leaping greenly spirits of trees, and a blue true dream of sky, and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I, who have died, am alive again today. And this is the sun's birthday. This is the birthday of life, and of love, and wings, and of the gay great happening illimitably earth. How should tasting, touching, hearing, seeking, breathing, any lifted from the no of all nothing, human merely, be, merely being, doubt unimaginable you, capital Y. Now the ears of my ears awake, and now the eyes of my eyes are open. There was a, a clerk, an ordinary clerk in South Carolina. His name was Daniel Whitehead Hickey. He never knew any praise for his poems, and he led a rather solitary life but he would write every day. And this is a poem called Snow Silence. Before me and behind me stretch the day to east and west a meadowland of gray. The wind blew sharp and scratched among the boughs. Slow smoke breathe from the chimney of each house. A bird flew past me, with no greeting said. The road beneath my feet grew hard as lead. And from the gullies there I saw a light, as eyes of rabbits stared into the night. Sheltered beneath a frozen vine, their fur so soft, no blade of grass made any stir. I passed a farmer, turning in his lane. He looked my way but once, and not again. Then hurried on, and with no word for me, nor pondered on whose neighbor I might be. And thus I learned from man and bird a wing, 
Snow silence is a sort of holy thing. Beautiful. And the last poem, and then I have to go and call them. This is by James Arlington Wright. He passed away in 1980. I haven't found much of his poetry very inspired, but this one is, and I share it with you. It's called A Blessing. Just off the highway to Rochester, Minnesota, twilight bound softly forth on the grass, and the eyes of those two Indian ponies darken with kindness. They have come gladly out of the willows to welcome my friend and me. We step over the barbed wire into the pasture where they have been grazing all day alone. They ripple tensely. They can hardly contain their happiness that we have come. They bow shyly as wet swans. They love each other. There is no loneliness like theirs. At home once more, they begin munching the young tufts of spring in the darkness. I would like to hold the slender one in my arms, for she has walked over to me and nuzzled my left hand. She is black and white. Her mane falls wild on her forehead, and the light breeze moves me to caress her long ear that is delicate as the skin over a girl's wrist. Suddenly I realize that if I stepped out of my body, I would break into blossom. All of us are children of mother. We sing as unified children of a mother who love each other, who pray for each other, who revere each other because the soul of each of them belongs to the mother and she is in charge, not we. Oh.